talking uh, today about the family and the children from birth to 8 to 10 years of age. We're spending a lot of time in this area because as in building a house, it's very important how you build and how you start out. And so these early years of a child's life is, are the most important and will ultimately result in their destiny. And so we have on the platform today, once again, we have a number of bags to my right uh, that are full of color. Light, and I have a flashlight here. When you're walking in the dark, a flashlight comes in handy. Uh, to have light, to see where you're walking. So you don't step in a hole, you don't get off of the path. And so I love this little flashlight. It's light, it's easy to carry. And that's a reminder to me that when I'm walking in God's plan, it's light. He said, my burden is light, it's easy. My yoke, my yoke is light. And a yoke is used to help in the work. So I actually have five uh, different ways this light can come on and uh, it'll also do some blinking there. So light is powerful, light is helpful and education is all about bringing light to our minds, light, understanding so that when we say, oh, I see, I understand. Do you like it when you don't understand? <laughs> no. You're like, it's like you're in the dark. And so when we're speaking the same language, you're understanding, then it's like the light's coming on. And so my colors over here are a reminder of how God wants us to start out learning. He wants us, as little children who can't read the written page, to be able to read his messages through symbols, color, numbers, um, objects. And so that's what we want to teach our children. Hannah was a mother in the Bible, and she prayed for a son. She prayed and prayed and prayed, and he didn't come. And so she gave up. Many times God says, wait, wait. He knows what's best, and we give up too soon. So God is trying to teach us when he says, wait. He's trying to teach us what character quality? Patience. Where in the Bible does it talk specifically about the last day people and what character quality will stand out more than any others. Patience. Here are the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Jesus walked by faith when he was on this earth. And education, true education, is about building your faith. Building your faith in God and God's divine plan for the family and for the education of our children. So I'm going to be going over to the bags every now and then and picking some things out of the bags that will help us be reminded of the spiritual, the higher education. And I was telling you about Hannah. She prayed for a son. She gave up and so her husband got another wife and they had a baby. And so that brought family, the family, it brought confusion into the family, and there was a lot of problems when there's more than one wife or spouse. And so God said one. He, he said specifically it's best to have one spouse because there's an object lesson there that God wants to teach us. He wants us to be reminded in the family that he's the husband we're the bride. The church is like the bride. And how Jesus, the husband, treats the church, the bride, that's how husbands you're to treat your wives. 
And Jesus doesn't want to have many wives, many spouses. He wants to be married to one. And um, we have, though, through sin, we have a lot of broken homes. God can come in. We're shown even with Jacob and the number of wives that he had, and he had 12 sons. We see that there was trouble there, but through God's plan of education, uh, the majority of the tribes got victory. There were a couple that didn't, Ephraim and um, Dan. And so by studying those families, you'll find out what type of weaknesses they could have been overcome but were not. And so part of education is learning what is our weakness, what are our defects in character, both inherited and cultivated. That means learned uh, in, in the home, basically. God wants us to overcome those and education is all about doing that, learning about the things that God has made so we can know Him and then also seeing ourselves in comparison to His law and then getting victory over our weaknesses and um, becoming that balanced, symmetrical character. So Hannah prayed, she continued to pray and she was given a son. What was his name? Do you know? Samuel, that's right, the prayed for little boy. She only had him just a few years because she promised that she would take him to the synagogue and there he would minister and learn how to be a minister, a rabbi. And um, so in the short years that she had Samuel from birth till he was weaned, she taught him this way. Every familiar thing that he saw, she would point to heaven and remind him of the spiritual lesson that that thing pointed, was to point him to. So the physical world around him, the things that were familiar, were a constant reminder of the higher school, the higher um, part of life that we need to develop the spiritual or moral part so in that short amount of time she educated him that way then when he was weaned he went to the synagogue and there he was under priest Eli priest Eli was a father but he was an indulgent father he did not discipline his children and his two sons uh, ministered in the sanctuary and we're told that they uh, had strange fire in other words they departed from God's instruction they were not disciplined when they were in error they were not corrected by the father and those sons brought a lot of um, error and a lot of weakness to Israel until God had to punish them himself and when God punishes it is many times very severe and so parents it is your job your responsibility to educate your children and discipline them when they're young that's the easiest time to teach them and to discipline them and um, still uh, Samuel uh, was being educated by his mother from home. Every year she made him something. What did she make him? A coat. That's right. That's what was lost by Adam and Eve when they sinned. They lost their innocence, their robe of innocence, that robe of light. Get my flashlight out here. They lost the robe of light. And so she wanted to remind him every year of that robe that was lost and uh, was needed in education. And so every year she made him that robe. It reminds us also of another son that was given a robe. Who was that? Joseph. He was given a robe also. And it was a coat of what? Many colors. Many colors. Here we have many colors. Um, those of you who helped and volunteered were given these 
uh, little uh, name plates so that you could write your name and I still have those and I'll show you a little later what we're going to do with those. The name is very important. The name uh, of the Israelites chose names for their children that represented a character quality that the parents wanted in their children, wanted to establish in the children. And so the name, the name of Jesus, by the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, we're told. And so the name represents God's glory, God's character. And that's what he, God, is wanting us to develop in our education. Samuel uh, started the school outside of the home for God's people, the school of the prophets. Before that time, from the Garden of Eden up until that time, the school was the home. But the home broke down, and so there needed to be a school outside of the home where students could be taught to be leaders in the church especially. And eventually, by the time Jesus came, those schools had also broken down. So uh, what we're wanting to do here is to show you, help you to see the importance of the early years and the training that you as parents are to give to your children. All right, we're going to start uh, the family birth to eight or 10 years of age. The mother is to be the best teacher, or the mother is the best teacher, and nature is the lesson book, right along with the scriptures. In Ephesians 3.14, it says, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So we belong to the family of God in heaven and in earth. Isn't that wonderful? Ephesians 3.14, Christians are all members of one family, all children of the same heavenly father with the same blessed hope of immortality. That is such a, an amazing principle to believe that God's promises are true and that we can live forever not just a short life here but we need to know how to live that short life here because this is our probationary time to show God and the universe that we're fit to live in a perfect holy heaven very close and tender should be the tie that binds them together. Acts of the Apostles, page 550. So what is to tie us together as a family? Jesus, being part of the family of God, we are um, very close, we have a very close and tender tie that binds us together. The family tie, if we could have maybe, let's see how many families are here. We're told the family tie is the closest, the most tender and sacred of any on earth. Could we start like over here and could we have one family stand up and then we'll acknowledge you. Maybe you could say uh, the name of your family and we'll just go around and see who the families are that are here. Yes. Okay, and say your name. Your. Okay, good, thank you. And the next family. The family tie is the closest. Are you family right here? Your husband is not here? Well, you could stand for him and... Good, all right, and say your name. All right, the family tie is the most tender and the closest and sacred. Yes, how about the next one? Your parents aren't here. How many families are represented? Raise your hand if you're a different family. Amber, just one family member. 
All right, so we may have a couple of families here. How about back there? How many families? Okay, good, good. So we have a couple families back here. How many families over here? Two. All right, very good. And here, how many families? One, yes, another family, another family. Okay, good, another family, and I know this gentleman here. <clears throat> the family tie is the closest, the most tender and sacred of any on earth. It was designed to be a blessing to mankind, and it is a blessing whenever the marriage covenant is entered into intelligently, in the fear of God, and with due consideration for its responsibilities. Responsibilities. We're going to take a look a little later uh, about something in nature that teaches us responsibility, and there's many things, but we're going to look at one of them. So here we have intelligence. That's important. That's light. Once again, intelligence. So we need to be teaching uh, that in our families. Then the fear of God. The fear of God. In Revelation 14 it says, fear God and give glory to him. So the first angel's message is, families, you are actually in true education teaching your children the three angels' messages by teaching true education. So that's where it starts right in the family with the children. In the fear of God and with due consideration for its responsibilities. It's very important that families understand their responsibility. The family life. We need to study diligently family government. We had a mayor here yesterday and he's involved with governing uh, the community making sure that laws and the civil laws and so forth are obeyed and so forth. And parents, it's your responsibility in the home to make sure that there is family government in the home. And that's how you can be a missionary field right where you are. Right principles must be established in what? What does it say up here? Right principles must be established in what of the child? Mind. The mind. All right, let's have a child or a family come up and let's take a look at what's in here. The red bag. What does the red bag represent? Red. Blood, is blood, blood, and blood is life. Did Jesus shed his blood for us? Sacrifice, sacrifice. So red reminds us of sacrifice. We have some people with some red in their, their um, clothing to remind us of sacrifice. We, we need to have that in our life every day. All right, so is, can I have someone come up? Someone... Sure. And there's two things, so I want you to take out only that which we're talking about that has to do with the mind. All right. Well, you hold that up. And that actually comes apart. You want to take that apart? Yes, it comes apart. And the ear actually comes out as well so that you can see the parts of the brain and the parts of the mind and, uh, and the head and so forth. And you can see the names. And uh, this is a good way for the children. They need to be looking, observing, holding on to. And as they're uh, studying these things, you can help them to see that the mind is the most sacred place, the most holy place. So we don't want to, there's something else in here. You can take it out. We don't want um, any of our senses to take in, because what we take in through our senses goes to the mind, to the brain. So if we violate God's laws, 
with our senses, it will affect the most sacred, most holy place. It will defile it like um, Eli's sons defiled the sanctuary. So you're defiling the sanctuary if through, what is this that you have? An eye, that's right. So the things that you see, if the things that you see, are we watching uh, fiction? Are we watching, are we taking in um, brutality, uh, killing, uh, evil things that affects us, it affects our minds? Because there's a law that says by beholding the things that you see, you'll be changed into that image. So if we're playing, um, I want to say video games, but uh, games of any type that are war games or even frivolous things that don't really mean anything, um, that are, are just perverting our minds, we're taking that in and that's what we will be changed into the likeness of. All right, thank you. Our senses. Uh, when I teach the sanctuary, there are five pillars that uh, are the entrance to the, m the holy place and then the most holy place. And those five pillars can represent um, our most um, important doctrines that we teach, but also uh, our senses. We have how many senses? Five senses. And can we name them? Sight, hearing, what is it? Smell, taste, touch. You want, and the children can, I have paper and pencils, they can be taking notes. You can have them uh, drawing pictures if they can't write, drawing pictures of the nose, the eyes, the ears, the tongue, touch. Uh, because it's through these senses that the enemy comes in and defiles our sanctuary. And it's so important, parents, to be guiding what your children are taking in through their senses. It's like opening a door, either to good or to evil. And what did Jesus say at the beginning? Don't go near that tree. Don't go near the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We were never intended to behold or hear evil. Never. Children do not need to see evil. In nature, they will see now what sin has wrought. They might see, and we don't watch a lot of um, predators devouring their prey. We don't watch that. Um, but yet it's out there. And so there are things in nature that point us to what sin has wrought. But we don't spend most of our time. In Philippians, it tells us, think on what kinds of things? True. True. Honest. Honest. Pure. Pure. Lovely. If they have any virtue, think on these things. So what we think on, remember we've been learning about seeds and how to take care of seeds. The things that we think on, the thoughts, are seeds. So what kind of seeds is Philippians telling us to plant in our children's minds? Good seeds, right? Good seeds that are going to produce good fruit. Because the seeds of wickedness that we behold, that we listen to, the wrong kind of music, the music that is breaking all the laws. There are laws to music. Most people don't know them. Oh, it just sounds good to me. It, oh, it makes me feel good. Uh, that's not criteria. It's law, principle. We must learn to live by principle. Eat by principle, drink by principle, dress by principle. Principles are laws. And law is love. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll what? Keep my commandments. Here are the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep my commandments. And those commandments, law, is summed up with one word, love. Love to God and love to man. So we're loving God first by keeping the law, 
keeping the law of dress, keeping the law of digestion, keeping the law of cleanliness in the camp so that we don't get sick. Laws, principles, parents, you're setting the foundation for your children's destiny. And it takes more than prayer. Prayer is communion with God. And then part of prayer is you being a part of answering the prayer by reading what the laws and principles are and keeping them. We're going to go back over here to my table. And <clears throat> what is the color of the cloth that these colors are on? Gold. What does gold represent? In the sanctuary, in the outer court, there was no gold, not even in the curtains at the gate. But when you came to the curtains going into the holy place and into the most holy place, then you started to see gold. There was, when you would go in and only the priests could go in, but we can go in now in uh, imagination uh, when they went into the holy place, what was gold? There was gold on the table of showbread where the bread was set. There was gold, one talent of gold in the lampstand. And that one talent in that la lampstand is a symbol of the talents that God has given to you and your children. Everyone has been given at least one talent, and that talent God wants you to use as a light, like that lampstand, as a light to the world. Where's my light again? Light. God wants you to use your talent, develop your talent, so that you can bring glory to God. Everything that God has made brings glory to Him. Everything is obedient to Him, except for the sinful heart of man. And so, parents, that's your job, to help your children take the talent that God has given them and develop it and be a light to others, to bring glory to God, not to the child. God will lift up your child as your child lifts God up. It's not anything that they can do of themselves. God gives the talent. God gives even that desire to continue to be obedient to develop that talent. It all goes back to God. Well, there's gold in the sanctuary. There was gold in the uh, altar of incense. But the interesting thing is the gold was over something. Do you know what it was over? Pardon? The ark, yes, once into the most holy place. But the... W like this pulpit right now is wood. What if we put gold over it? It would be beautiful, wouldn't it? But you wouldn't see the wood. But there is wood. The wood represents you and I. The wood represents humanity. And God wants the gold that represents him, faith and love, Revelation says faith and love. He wants that gold to be the only thing seen, not you, not self, not humanity. We have no power without God. Your heart beats because of the life of God. You have life. Every breath that you take is like a prayer. And that altar of incense uh, represented the prayers of the saints, the prayers going up, but those prayers have no merit except for the blood that was placed upon the horns of that altar. The blood of Jesus is what it represents. So gold, children, they need to know what that means. We don't wear gold like gold rings and gold earrings and we don't wear the outward adornment of gold today because God wants us to realize that the gold that he wants us to understand first before we wear it and walk on it because in heaven we're going to walk on it he wants us to understand what it means spiritually because spiritually is the higher education 
So when we understand it and can live that way on this earth without wearing it on the outside and God, not God, but others recognizing that you have something that no one else has or very few, it's rare. Is gold rare today? It's rare and what makes it valuable? It makes it valuable because of course the uh, type of element that it is very pure and um, it it's very valuable because it is rare and so today what makes you valuable is when you demonstrate the character of Jesus in your life and the only way you can demonstrate it is if you're beholding it if you're hearing it and so in your curriculum in your education that's what you want to be beholding, is the character of Jesus, and then you will be clothed in it. You will demonstrate it. So gold represents what? Divinity. We cannot have the character of Christ without God and his spirit helping us. And so faith and love is needed, and love represents all of God's character qualities. All right, so when we talk about principles, that's by being obedient to principle, we are demonstrating the character of God. Right principles must be established in the mind of the child. Humility or pride. The uh, Jewish or Israelites, they wandered in the wilderness God was trying to re-educate them, retrain them, and um, they, uh, the adults were having a struggle with something called pride. They did not have humility, and so going into the Promised Land, they could not go in because they held on to pride. And that's something that must be burned up, must be given to God so that he can humble us or we can humble ourselves. We're told to humble ourselves because when God humbles us, it's sometimes very, very harsh. Um, and so he's, God is calling us to do that ourselves, humble ourselves. It says, parents generally have not taken a proper course with their children. They are not restrained as they should be. They are left to indulge in pride. Pride would be... Um, doing my own will, doing what I want to do, what I like to do, instead of being obedient to father and mother. But if father and mother are not giving the, uh, setting up the rules and regulations and the principles to follow, then the children will develop this pride. They are left to indulge in pride and follow their own inclination. Anciently, parental authority was regarded and children were in subjection to their parents. They feared and reverenced them, but the order in the last days is reversed. So here is fear and reverence. And in the three angels' message, remember, that is number one. Number one message of the three angels' messages is fear God and give glory to him. So God is calling us back to fearing God. Some parents are in subjection to their children. And I, you're looking at one right here who allowed my newborn son to become king. And by the time he was four years old, he believed he reigned in my home. And that's when I kind of had to turn things around because I had developed within him uh, that belief. It was a wrong belief, and that is probably why my son today is not a Christian, plus many other reasons. So I'm giving you uh, some ideals now to help you save your children and help them to know God and, and make it into the promised land. It's through the right kind of education, especially early on when their minds, their brains, their, their minds, their hearts are moldable, they're soft, they're plastic, so to speak. 
and now is the time to um, help them fear and reverence God by fearing and reverencing mother and father. Some parents are in subjection to their children. They fear their children and yield to them. They fear to cross the will. This is the cross, I believe, that Jesus learned from the cradle to the grave. We've been studying about the resurrection. Last week we studied about the trial that Jesus went to. And sometimes, well, especially the world celebrates the resurrection. But we need to understand, we need to be enlightened as to what it means to bear the cross. And so, parents, when you're teaching your children to obey you, you are teaching them to bear the cross. Do they like it? No. For the most part. They don't like it. They don't want to. They don't feel like it. And so you're teaching them by teaching them to obey you, to bear the cross. The cross is not my will, but thine. Yours, Father. It's your will. Um, I need to obey you. That's the cross. And you can see in even a newborn the will, and it strengthens as you indulge them, as you, as I did, cater to their every cry, their every whimper. You're right there to do their bidding. You become their servant. If you don't take care of their needs and then let them know, uh, put them on a regular schedule. I didn't do that. I didn't have a regular schedule. And so by the age of, I think it was two and a half uh, years old, oh, it was 18 months old, I got mononucleosis. Mononucleosis is something that a lot of people get when they go to college and they just, they're, they're going to classes all day and they're studying all night and they just don't get any rest. Well, that was me, a young mother. Um, many, many broken laws, health laws, and so forth. And so I got so sick, I couldn't even get out of bed to get myself a drink of water. And I was nursing this 18-month-old baby, and I was doing, catering to his every little whimper and cry, and God said, that's it, the end. You're not going to be able to get up. And I had to say no to him the first time in his little life, 18 months old. And you know what he said to me? <laughs> I didn't teach him this. I don't even know where he learned it, but he told me, I, in so many words, he told me he did not love me, but of course it wasn't that nice. And he screamed it out, 18 months old. I had molded that little 18 month old from the birth, from the time he was born until 18 months old. He remembers at four years old when I told him, no, you cannot have another piece of pie. And he put, made this temper tantrum scene. I, that's when it hit me the most. I'm doing something way wrong. And so I went back to these quotes that I'm sharing with you. And I was reading what God was saying, how I should have been raising my child and training him. And um, by that time, by the time he was four, um, he had a room full of toys. And we're told that children only need a few, a few is two or three toys, and they should be toys that are useful, and um, they should be learning how to use their tools to be helpful and useful. Well, he remembers the experience. I backed up my station wagon and took about three loads off to the thrift store. And uh, he won't ever forget that. Um, it's very hard to change a wrong course. And uh, your children will begin to see if you begin to change the way you may have been indulgent with them. Especially by the age of three, they should know obedience and self-control. If you haven't taught them that, then it's going to be harder to change. But it's needful to change, and you can do it healthily, cheerfully, and um, lovingly, tenderly, uh, the way that God did with the children of Israel, bringing them out of Egypt, setting them up, and re-educating them, teaching them how to eat, how much to eat. There was only so much manna that fell. They had to go out before the sun came up. 
fill up their little cup and that was it. And then on Friday they got enough for Sabbath. There wasn't any that fell then. And um, they had to learn how to eat simply in, in the uh, wilderness. They had to, uh, we're told that their clothes and shoes didn't wear out. So they lived simply. And uh, many other lessons, uh, they were taught there, but not all learned them. All right. Parents should move with decision, requiring the, follow, the following uh, out of their views of right. Requiring the following, I don't know if that's exactly the way it's written. We'd have to go back and, and look at that. The divine plan, the greatest suffering has come upon human, the human family because parents have departed from the divine plan to follow their own imaginings and imperfectly developed ideas. Many parents follow impulse. They forget that the present and future good of their children requires intelligent discipline. And we mentioned yesterday I did about discipline, meaning uh, this, having the same root as disciples, Jesus, in taking and asking 12 men to follow him, he disciplined them. He had to correct them. He was educating them. He made sure that they were with him. And when they had meetings, they were always closest to him, listening to everything that he said. And then they would be helping. They were his helpers. And so families, uh, your children are to be trained to be your helpers in the family. So the greatest suffering has come upon the human family because parents have departed from the divine plan. Parents do their children great wrong when they allow them to scream and cry. They should not be allowed to be careless and boisterous. If these objectionable traits of character are not checked in their early years, they will take them with them strengthened and developed into the religious and business life. Children will be just as happy if they are taught to be quiet in the house. Wise rules and regulations. Fathers and mothers, be sensible. Teach your children that they must be subordinate to law. That means law is what we obey. Law is what governs. Law is what brings peace and order. And without law, we have chaos. And we see that in um, nations where there's not law. And of course, law can be enforced in the wrong way. And so parents, it's important for you to behold Jesus and his character to see how to enforce the law uh, in love, but firmness. Do not allow your children to think that because they are children, it is their privilege to make all the noise they wish in the house. The house is to be a place where angels want to come. And so the home is to be a little heaven on earth. Wise rules and regulations must be made and enforced that the beauty of the home life may not be spoiled. Our children are to be educated. This is from Isaiah. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. From babyhood, the character of the child is to be molded and fashioned in accordance with the divine plan. Virtues are to be instilled into its opening mind. And the root of all virtues is humility. Humility. And so we're taken then to Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus told the people how they could be happy. And that first beatitude is blessed are the poor in spirit, humility, realizing that we are just like wood, can be burned up. We're made out of clay, but we're also, it's represented as a tree, a messenger. A tree is a messenger. And God wants to overlay his, his love, his character, he wants to combine divinity with humanity so that we can represent rightly his character not only to this planet but to the universe. And that's going to be one of our jobs, you might say, our duties to go to other worlds and to tell them our story. And our story is his story. 
history is, true history is truly God's story. For the first eight or ten years of a child's life, the field or garden is the best schoolroom, the mother the best teacher, and nature the best lesson book. Children of eight, ten, or twelve years are old enough to be addressed on the subject of personal religion. Do not teach your children with reference to some future period when they shall be old enough to repent and believe the truth. If properly instructed, very young children may have correct views of their state as sinners and of the way of salvation through Christ. My daughter was about, she may tell you differently her age, but I think she was about 14. And it was really one of the most blessed baptisms I, I've ever been to because my daughter knew what she believed. And she didn't just go and be baptized, which was a beautiful experience, but she went and she gave a talk on what she believed. She gave her testimony. And it was, to me, a mother who had done, had many things started out in her life uh, wrong. But as I saw the wrong uh, and the errors and that I wasn't following God's divine plan, I would ask God for help to bring me back and put me on the right path. And then children have the ability to reason about this time, 8, 10, 12 years old, and so they must choose if this is what they want to do. And it's so wonderful when they choose and really know and understand what it means to walk in the new life, the new man, you might say, after Jesus. If properly instructed, very young children may have correct views of their state as sinners and of the way of salvation through Christ. Ecclesiastes 12.1 says, Remember now the Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil, evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. And there is a mother hen with her little chicks under her wings. That's what we're told Jesus felt like he wanted to do when he was walking on this earth but his children would not. Seek the Lord early. Proverbs 8, 17, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in this picture, uh, we have an Ark of the Covenant that was made out of wood and then painted with gold. And then my son is on the right. On the right. That was when he was younger. And he um, was learning God's ways. Uh, this is a picture of my family. My father was not a Christian. Uh, my mother uh, was, but yet she did not know um, how to train us God's way. So I went to public school the first eight grades of my life. Then I was very blessed to be taken out of public school and put into uh, Adventist or Christian schools. Um, very much blessed to be out of the public system but then God took me a step further and when I had my own children he helped me to see and understand better true education and for my daughter she was never placed out of the home school she has always been homeschooled parents should be the only teachers of their children until they have reached eight or ten years of age as fast as their minds can comprehend it the parents should open before them God's great book of nature. Mother should find time to cultivate in herself and her, in her children a love for the beautiful buds and opening flowers by calling the attention of her children to their different colors and variety of forms. She can make them acquainted with God through the flowers. And I appreciate so much uh, the flowers that are out here and this centerpiece here is just so beautiful it reminds me every flower reminds me of Eden they're a treasure from Eden she can make them acquainted with God who made all the beautiful things which attract and delight them she can lead their minds up to their Creator and awaken in their young hearts a love for their Heavenly Father who has manifested so great love for them parents can associate God with 
all his created works. And we're going to take a look at one of them. And I have one in here. Let's see if I can spot it. Oh, yes. Okay, if someone wants to come up, and um, I want them to find in here, if you come up, I'll give you one of these as well. So you can write your name and give it back to me, and I'll tell you about what I want from that. I'll put this in here. But if someone would come up and uh, get the eagle out of the bag, eagles represent responsibility, knowing and doing what is expected of me. The bald eagle's life, commitment to its mate, and dedication to its young make it a noble emblem of many nations. The eagle, knowing and doing what is right. That's the um, definition of responsibility. Now, how can we, okay, we're not going to have anybody come up and get the eagle? Want to? <coughs> And you could take it and pass it around so everyone can hold it and feel it while we talk a little bit more about the eagle. Yeah, just go ahead and take it and pass it around. Eagles represent responsibility. Responsibility is knowing and doing what is right. And how do we use our wills in responsibility? Let's go through five I wills. This is how to train the will to do what's right in the area of responsibility. I will keep my promises. Is that what God says? He says he'll keep his promises. Um, I will not make excuses. That's number two. I will do all my work to the best of my ability. I will make things right when I do wrong. I will know my duty and will do my duty. Those are five ways to teach your child how to use their will to be responsible. And I think in all of these five ways, we can see how God shows us responsibility as well. Three, I will do all my work to the best of my ability. I will do all my work to the best of my ability. I will make things right when I do wrong. This four, and I will know my duty and will do my duty. Um, in the United States, there is a little, um, there are booklets. There is another church, the Baptist Church, that really teaches character and nature. And they have put together these little booklets. Now they cost $10 each and they've been reformatted. This is an older copy. This is very, very good. This is better than the new format. So I have a whole, I have four series of these. Uh, it's four more elementary, but all of us, I believe, are elementary in the area of character. We could come up in that area and especially parents to help teach the children. Um, but this is available online. Uh, this is a booklet all on patience. And so it gives a definition, a definition from the Bible, from the concordance, from like an 1828 dictionary, which is a better dictionary than a modern dictionary. It gives a nature lesson. And the nature lesson we have in here, another um, object, the monarch butterfly. And so there's a whole lesson on the monarch butterfly and how the monarch butterfly teaches patience, that characteristic that God is calling us to, especially at the end of time. And so for a, a child, a little child, as well as we're told the heathen, the backslider, these types of object lessons help to draw them to what principles God is wanting them to know. And so the monarch, what is a monarch? It's a king, a king. So there's a, a king butterfly uh, that everyone, most everyone knows some things about the monarch. It uh, migrates a very long distance and then it doesn't live very long so it doesn't 
it's not able to come back from the migration and so it lays its eggs like it um, lays its uh, eggs on the way and then those babies develop and then they come back and so we have this cycle of going back and forth that can remind us that the monarch in the sky, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, He came here to live and die for us so that we can live eternally, but not live eternally in sin. Live eternally, keeping His principles. And even the babies of the monarch follow the same cycle. And so we want to be providing for our children the right pattern, the divine pattern, so that the cycle can be um, right. When we multiply and we have children and we don't educate them God's way, then they, like the monarch, it stays a monarch. But uh, we can't keep duplicating Christians if we don't train them to be Christians, educate them to be Christians. And so Satan has come into the system of education, and even though we may have a Christian school, it may be a, a wrong system. So the monarch, and this little booklet can help us. Um, there's crafts for young children. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Crafts for young children also in this booklet, and things to color, and ways to teach the, the will train the will in the right way to be, in this case, patient. In the case of the eagle, to be responsible. All right, and purple is a reminder to us that we are royalty. Royalty. And, um, oh, there's fascinating lessons in nature of how to get the color purple. And, um, and I'm not going to go into that right now, but the lessons are deep, they're wide, they help us to understand who we are, sons and daughters of Jesus Christ, and we're all one family that God is trying to reunite with him so that we can spend eternity with him. All right, we're going to be finishing up now um, early because we have moved the cooking class to this next uh, time period so that uh, when uh, these things are made, these recipes, then you'll be able to partake of it because it will be lunchtime. So let's have a word of prayer and I'll be back this afternoon to finish this lesson up. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your presence here, for keeping our mind focused on you and um, helping us to see and understand and I know that through your Holy Spirit, you will help us, empower us to walk in these ways. And we uh, want you to know that we do love you. And we're understanding better that to say that means that we will keep your principles and laws. So thank you for teaching us and continue to be with us as we go into the next class. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being attentive.